I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Cher Miller. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where Grandma has to carry groceries up 97 flights of stairs just to get to the kitchen. This is producer Melody Travers. In this season of Crazy Town, Jason, Asher, and Rob are exploring the watershed moments in history that have led humanity into the cascading crises we face in the 21st century. Today's episode is about skyscrapers and the great race to colonize the sky. The watershed moment took place in 1850. At the time, the estimated carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was 285 parts per million, and the global human population was 1.26 billion. So I grew up listening to the radio, as I'm sure you did, Jason, and Cher as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, so the uh, the WKRP pop KRP in Cincinnati. That was my favorite. <laughs> that's, station. that's pretty old. Uh, well, the, the pop station in my hometown of Atlanta used to introduce itself on the air. It would say Z93 broadcasting from the top of the world's tallest hotel. Ooh. What and uh, it was like this point of pride yeah. in Atlanta. We had the the world's tallest hotel. That was hotel. the only point of pride. It was it, well, well, you know, the Atlanta Braves were pretty good in those days. There were a few. Yeah, we had some. Uh, you know, MLK. That's a point of pride. But uh, Dale Murphy, for gosh sakes. But the world's tallest hotel was the Peachtree Plaza, and I, I thought it was an amazing. It was this giant glass cylinder of a building, and I thought it was it was pretty amazing. But you you look at it later and you're like, wow, they really had to qualify that. Like the world's tallest <laughs> hotel oh, with yeah. a glass facade that has, you know, it's like how many subcategories do you need to do to claim the tallest thing? Well, well, because other hotels 16. started getting built probably that were taller, but they weren't quite the same. Wasn't a hotel, was it? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, I bring this up because, well, our last episode was about uh, positive thinking, you know, and the the power I've been of it. I've changed ever since that we recorded. Yeah, that. yeah, right, yeah. You're a, you're so much more pleasant to be around. Yeah, now. Thank you. It's, I love it. Yeah. You remind me of Joel Osteen. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> well, in that episode, uh, we touched on quackery in the field of medicine. Right. That was the 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 kind of watershed moment. Was a guy who kicked off this positive thinking craze by Nobody willing crazy. away his tuberculosis. So we're going to stick on that theme for a few minutes with a a character I want to introduce you guys to named Dr. David Jane. Okay. This guy got a real medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1822. I'm sure the medical degrees then were like top notch. Yeah. Well, I... When I read that he went to to Penn, which uh, we've talked about as my alma mater. Yeah. I'm realizing like half the villains in Crazy Town seem to have come from my university, including you. It's getting yeah, I know. I'm 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 with them. It's starting to get uh, kind of distressing. You got Donald Trump that we've talked about. We talked about the junk bond guy, Michael Milken. Yeah. We've talked about Elon Musk a lot. And did he really? He went to Penn. Yeah. Now now we got David Jane. That's a pretty good lineup. I do want to say, we could also claim John Legend, Noam Chomsky, and the the famous suffragist Alice Paul, uh, among others. So it's not all all bad, at least. It's balanced. Yeah. Yeah. Fair and balanced, like Fox News, right? Yep. Anyways, uh, back to David Jane. Okay. So he opened a drugstore in Philadelphia in 1836. And he sold his his line of pills and balsams and liniments. What, What's a liniment? I don't know. Is there a difference between a liniment and a balsam? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna look this up though, and maybe <laughs> some kind make some. of uh, some kind of oil you rub on your your skin. Yeah. And he also had a mail order business, so I think he was like the the early Jeff Bezos here. <laughs> but the way that he sold his stuff is he'd put out this monthly almanac that he called Dr. D. Jane's Medical Almanac and Guide to Health. And it contained stuff like like the planetary orbits, of course, <laughs> yeah. and, and tide tables. Yeah. But then he had all this stuff on poisoning and intestinal worms and, and uh, of course, plentiful ads and testimonials for all his, his tonics and pills. 
So uh, if you'll humor me for a sec, I want to read you guys one of his ads. Okay, okay, I can't wait. This is for Jane's carminative balsam. Do you know what? <laughs> no. Do you know what carminative? I just means? want to no. say carminative balsam over and over again. Oh my gosh! Carminative means that it relieves flatulence. Okay. Ah. <laughs> I had no idea about this excellent uh, word, but I'm gonna. This is a great podcast. We I, learn so much. I know. You just want an excuse to bring that into somehow into the topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't just deal with flat. Listen to what it can do. This, okay. this is the ad right here. This is the most excellent, safe, speedy, and almost infallible remedy for almost dysentery, infallible. diarrhea, or looseness, <laughs> Asiatic cholera, cholera morbus, cholera infantum, or summer complaint, cramps, colic, griping pains, sour stomach, sick and nervous headache, pain or sickness of the stomach, vomiting, restlessness and inability to sleep, wind in the stomach and bowels, <laughs> hysterics, nervous tremors and twitchings, seasickness, wow. fretting, and crying infants. <laughs> And for all bowel affections and nervous diseases, thousands of certificates have been received from physicians, clergymen, and families of the first respectability bearing the strongest testimony in its favor. There is so much there. Like, does it actually get rid of babies? Is that... (laughs) Did I hear that right? Uh, No, I don't think you heard it right. I I think it It gets... It doesn't get rid of crying... Infants? It makes them Fretting stop. and crying. Inf- yeah. it, I think it stops the fretting and crying. Right. Does oh, not doesn't get rid of the infant. Yeah, yeah. They go okay. numb. If they had to list like possible side effects then, I would I would have loved to have heard. Oh, yeah. That would be a, uh, like they do now on those radio yeah. ads. That, that, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, as you might guess, an, an ad like that for this cure-all that covered all that stuff, it, it worked really well. You know, it makes me think, like, you know, we, people complain nowadays about the FDA and bureaucracy yeah. and the technocracy and too much oversight and, you know, libertarians are up in arms about all this. But it's like, this is why. <laughs> this is why that was all you done. You don't know that. This stuff could have worked okay. really well, Jason. Okay. Well, I'll tell you how it... No more crying babies ever. What it really worked well at was making this guy a lot of money. Oh, yeah. nice. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, it's it's not that big of a stretch to call him like the Jeff Bezos of, of his time. So what do you do when you when you make a lot of money? Well, you you, you find a, uh, somebody to build you a really big building. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing I think of. Yeah. So that's our, our watershed moment is when Jane worked with a carpenter architect. What was that like a carpet tech? Yes. Uh, to build himself some high rise office space. Hmm. And uh, this is downtown Philly. The project cost half a million dollars. And he set it up with, you know, exam rooms and waiting rooms and laboratories and a warehouse and all that. And it was a total. Of 10 stories tall, eight of those were functional. The top two were kind of more of a wooden observation deck. And guests could go up there and look out over the city. But you can arguably chalk that up to being the first skyscraper that was ever built. So wow. who's the tallest building in, in Philadelphia, obviously? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. It, you can go, if, if you want to look it up. You can Google the uh, you know Dr. David Jane and his building, and you can kind of see an old photo of the street and how it's. Uh, so 1850 is that when that was built? Yep, 1850. That's... And it lasted like 100 years or something, right? Yeah, it it it, it was 108 years. It got demolished in 1958, despite all this hubbub around. Oh, can we make this a historical landmark and yeah, and whatnot? But nope, knocked it down. So we're talking about skyscrapers today, right? That's our that's our. Thing. That's yeah. what we're rolling with. So yeah, that's I a think, pretty weak little skyscraper, ten stories. I guess that was a big deal at the time. Give yeah. the dude a break, man. Okay. Yeah. It's actually start. it's actually disputed. Of course, everything gets disputed. So yeah. it's disputed whether or not that was the first skyscraper. Oh. There's another building called the the Home Insurance Building in Chicago, built in 1885. I think that was like 180 feet tall or something like that. Of course, it depends on what you, how you define what a skyscraper is. None of them were actually scraping the sky. Let's, let's, <laughs> right. Let's be real about it. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So basically, we're talking about these these tall, human-made structures, artificially built tall structures. So there's probably been a lot of stuff. It seems like there's probably been stuff back in back in the day that's taller than this 10-story thing. Like, what, what's the history of this? Yeah, I mean, we, we could go prior to Jane and just talk about tall stuff for a sec, okay. right? So this, but his thing was it was a commercial building in a downtown, 
that selling that, stuff, selling and, stuff. Yeah. So that's where that's where it's called the skyscraper. But yeah, there's been taller stuff built before, probably, right? Yeah, I mean, if you go back, I mean, I think in the historical record, probably the 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 big one to look at are, are although these were not these were not buildings for people to work in or to live in necessarily. But you look at the Pisa, the the Great Pyramid of Pisa of yeah. Giza. Sorry, why did I say Pisa? Yeah, the Leaning Tower of Giza the and the Great Pisa. Pyramid of Pisa. Um, Pisa is pretty nice. The pyramids, right? Yeah. Some people are buried there, but not living there. But those are the tallest structures humans had built. And in fact, like if you look at the Great Pyramid of Giza, that's the largest, four hundred eighty-one feet tall. Mm-hmm. And that was built, you know, around twenty-five hundred BCE, and that was the largest structure for. A really, 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 really long time. Yeah, it wasn't until uh, old St. Paul's Cathedral in England at 489 feet. They got it eight feet taller, and that was in 1221. They, they didn't know, right? They just got lucky. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was a uh, total... I'm sure they knew, you know, somehow uh, it came to them in a dream or something. Well, 12, the year 1221. Huh? 21, that's yeah. impressive. Uh, I mean, you think we could have done better than that with the Washington Monument in the United States Capitol Mall area, which was only, it's bigger, okay, it's 555 feet, but that was in 1888. So, you know, that's over 600 years later than old St. Paul's Cathedral, well, and it's a pretty simple thing. You just kind of go yeah. up. Would we call it a skyscraper? I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it, it's an obelisk with a staircase in it. Yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess you can go inside of it. Yeah. yeah. Right? Now, these are just sort of tall structures, but... I think when we're talking about skyscrapers, we're really meaning buildings that you kind of inhabit for various purposes. Yeah, I mean, right. what what was going on is up until that point, everything was built basically out of stone. Okay, you know, you had these uh, mineral based buildings, right? And then uh, well, Jane wood, and right. I mean, what's that? The buildings were made out of wood too. Yeah, but I'm saying these these tall ones. You know, got they're it, like all it. have some kind of uh, a stone structure, at least in the foundation, and it's really the evolution of, of those techniques of, of how do you build these things tall that allowed Jane and, and then later others. Uh, you mentioned the one in Chicago, the home insurance building. That one's called out because it's one of the first ones that had a metal skeleton mm-hmm. to help support the building. And that was really the problem that, that people were trying to overcome. If you're building up, you got to overcome gravity. So if you're building out of stuff like the Washington Monument, these blocks of rock, you're basically having to build those things thicker and thicker the taller the building you because want to Because it's, it's so heavy, yeah. stone on stone. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, and, th- and think about like how not functional a building becomes when you have to right. have an 11-foot thick wall, right? right? You right. Uh, try putting a window through that sucker. Right, okay. So... In overcoming gravity, uh, you've got to start building with other materials. And so that, you know, it's industrial revolution time. That's when you start getting iron and then steel skeletal structures. And, you know, after that home insurance building was built in 1885, it was only four years later that the Eiffel Tower sprang up. And that sucker's 934 feet tall. But let me get back. These buildings, though, you know, I'm familiar with, they'll have the... The uh, the I beam you know steel skeletons, but then they'll also there'll be a lot of uh, concrete pores still. Yeah. But it's it's more like they're using then the skeleton to help support that, like it's together. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you as you build taller and taller, uh, you start running into these problems. Like you need a huge foundation, or you need to brace against the wind. Mm-hmm. So you you know all these other engineering advancements start coming into play. And one of the things that really pushed it along, you know, you'd think like, oh, this is an architect or a structural engineer somewhere just planning this. But it was really when mainframe computers came online and you could do a lot more calculations that allowed the engineers then to design and come up with uh, more and more configurations that were taller, stiffer, used less steel per square foot. And then you had composite materials and all these technologies. Also, you had the technologies for the inside of the building that was developing. I mean, uh, I guess you could have the chicken egg question, which came first, the skyscraper or the high speed elevator. Right. Because you're you're not uh, having much of a, a building if if people can't get up to the top of it. Well, definitely an elevator. I wonder about the high speed elevator. Right, that must have came after. No. Yeah, I mean, I, does, do you know if the first skyscraper we talked about from 1850 did that have an elevator? 
I have no idea. Okay. Uh, if it did, it was probably some dude at the top yeah, who was really pulling. strong and just pull people <laughs> up. Because you know? that's what I understand is that a lot of these buildings just didn't go any higher because it was impractical to expect people to walk up so far. Yeah. When I was in college, we lived in this 24-story dorm. Okay. And uh, I once raced a couple of friends of mine. There were three stairwells, and we each got our own stairwell and raced up it. I, I will say that is the most tired I have ever been, I think, in my entire life. Like when we got done, I was like sort of uh, spitting to keep from vomiting, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, to taste blood in my mouth kind of thing. You know? Who yeah, won? I'm Come just on. thinking about also like all the mechanical systems that have to come into play for like moving air, moving water. And of course, that requires electricity if you're getting these big buildings. Yeah, you're exactly right. There was a sort of dual technological development going on. It's the the building structure itself, but also how do we work the interiors of these buildings and the, and the lighting the services? Even, right? Yeah. Well, but it definitely led to a craze, right? There was a, a, a certain point in time where it hit this kind of critical mass of skyscraper mm-hmm. building and famously, obviously, in New York City. And there are these amazing photos of, of the guys working on building those skyscrapers, like way up in the, in the oh, sky, yeah. you know, like hanging out and eating their lunches, you know. On, yeah, pretty badass. <laughs> pretty incredible, you know. And uh, I'm a guy who doesn't like heights that, you know, even looking at those photos kind of freak, freaks me out. But, yeah, you had this craze happening no, in New York. No safety systems no. whatsoever. It's like a guy on a swinging girder, you know, like hanging on with his legs. Well, you were talking about, you were talking about bureaucratic s- systems, Jason, earlier. Right. But I guess all those early uh, builders of skyscrapers are glad there was no OSHA around. Right. Like, can you imagine? I wonder how many people didn't make it in oh. these buildings. Yeah. yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, so you know, they, these this kind of craze took over New York City and Chicago. Those are sort of main hubs of this, but obviously there are other cities that, that had their their share of skyscraper buildings. Yeah, like oh, yeah. Atlanta with the world's tallest hotel. Right. <laughs> that that was well, the pinnacle of the whole thing. Right? Well, I you know when I was growing up, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, and San Francisco was always just super impressive because it it was the only place around in my region you could go and see these things. And I ended up working in downtown San Francisco off and on for this company that uh, I wasn't always there, but I would go visit the San Francisco headquarters. It was in a skyscraper in the financial district. And the views, you know, you were just in awe much of the time about being up there a few hundred feet above the ground and looking at the bay and the bridges and the little people in traffic and the other skyscrapers in your midst and watching the sun move. And it, it is quite spectacular, I must say, to be inside these things. Yeah, I I definitely see the kind of inspiration side of it. I had an experience like that in Chicago. Uh, I was visiting a relative, and uh, you guys ever see the old uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off movie? Oh, yeah. Uh, The question is how many times? Right, right. Well, and and that's carried over today. A lot of kids have seen that movie. Uh, I showed it to my kids. They weren't, they they didn't like it as as much as I had hoped. Well, they probably have better taste than I you think that's, do, that's but, what's going on. But uh, if, if if you remember that movie, the the actual day off, besides like ditching school, the first thing they do is they go to the what was then known as the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower, in Chicago, and they go up to the top of it. The three characters, Ferris Bueller and his girlfriend Sloane and his his best friend Cameron. And they they get to the the observation yeah. place inside, and and Ferris is like, okay, everybody, stand up on the railing and put your head against the glass and and look out. And he says, isn't that great? And uh, Sloane's like, oh, the city looks so peaceful from up here. And then Ferris says, anything is peaceful from one thousand three hundred and fifty three feet. <laughs> and then Cameron's like, I think I see my dad. That son of a bitch is down there somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I it was making me think. Maybe Asher, you're the Cameron of this podcast. Probably. And, uh, <laughs> I've often been accused of that. But uh, but we did this in Chicago. That exact experience. Like you know, you go up to the top of the Sears Tower, put your Ferris Bueller head against the glass, and look out. And it's kind of like personal level, exciting, whatever. But I think the bigger thing to note here is. This was a point of pride for the nation. Yes. It's like America, Chicago, New York City, maybe San Francisco, I don't know, maybe Atlanta. But we're like the skyscraper 
We, when I was a kid, we had the biggest and best skyscrapers. I remember that. Yeah, For sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we. I, I. And now we don't even have Sears anymore. I knew how many floors were in the skyscrapers. Like, I, I, yeah. I could tell you. I think it was like 106 in the Sears Tower, or something like that. Yeah, there were always 72 about, in the other ones, or whatever. You're always talking about like uh, throwing you off the Empire State Building. <laughs> right, right, like it was right. just part of the the culture. Right. But but that's all kind of uh, evolved now. And to highlight that evolution, I want to have a game show with the two of you. Excellent. On, okay. on international skyscrapericity, skyscraperhood, yes. skyscraperification. Yes. Let's do this. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. What I want to set up is that each of you gets to pick a city, uh, an international city outside of the United States, and what you're trying to do, uh, you're, you're each going to get three cities. Okay. And uh, you're trying to pick the cities that have the most skyscrapers in them. Ah. So yeah. we're going to total up your three cities, and we're going we're, we're gonna to see who's got the, uh, the better knowledge here. I should let the audience know that beforehand we had an epic rock, paper, scissors match. Yes. It took like 27 rounds before yeah, I, finally, I finally won. Yeah, Asher's yeah. got the he's got a leg up in this competition. Yeah, he goes first. So you, Asher, get to draft your first city. What's it going to be? I think I got to go. I got to go somewhere in China. So I'm I'm going to say Shanghai. Okay. Oh, All right, God. Jason. That was going to be nine number one. Ah. Oh. Okay. Well, most of the big stuff is there now. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with Hong Kong. Okay. Okay, that's a good choice. Let's go take it back over to a share. Careful, What's your number man. two? Don't don't call that China. I know, I know, I know. That's that controversial. I know, I know. I'm gonna stick with China. Let's go with Beijing. Ah. Okay, we're getting a we're getting ah. a very China centric skyscraper draft that's here. One of the biggest. The number two pick China. in the Jason Bradford side. Okay, well I'm gonna move it around a little bit. Um, big urban center. Let's go with Singapore. Okay, staying over there in that's the in one. the east. Mm-hmm. Back to you, Asher. Yeah, You're on the clock. East. Again, I'm thinking about big, big, big cities, right? Yeah. Lots of people. Uh, let's go Tokyo. Okay. Ooh, that's a good yeah, one. Tokyo. Sprawling, massive. All right, let's finish it off, Jason. Your final pick. Oh, what do I even call this? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm very sensitive now. I'm going to call it Taipei. I'm not even going to say what nation it's in. Okay. okay. I would call it Taiwan. <laughs> okay. I think that's all right. Okay. But, okay. I, I don't know if I get in trouble. Okay, so a shares team is Shanghai, Beijing, and Tokyo versus Jason's team, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taipei. Oh God! I, oh God! You guys ready? Be, you ready? This is gonna be ready? close. Okay, your winner. Your winner is. I'm gonna just announce the winner. Okay. Your winner is Jason. <gasps> oh man. Nice. So here's here's okay. why because he got the dominant city. Hong oh. Kong has 518 skyscrapers. Baby. Wow. Number one on the list. Thank you. Uh, Asher, your, your top pick of Shanghai has 180 oh my God, that's What's a lot funny less. is I was going to go with Shanghai. Yeah. I'm lucky you went first. Wow. Yeah, that was, uh, that was fifth on the, on the list. Okay. Uh, Beijing has 52. Tokyo, I know, it's 27th on the list. Wow. Uh, Tokyo has 165 that's skyscrapers. That's pretty good. A little better. Yeah. Anyway, we will... Post a uh, link to it's this. This is all sponsored by Wikipedia, anyway, <laughs> so anyone can find this. But but the idea is, you know, we'll we'll put so the list there. If say you really that want number to look at again it. for Hong Kong. How many were five hundred and eighteen? Yeah, it's a, it's a so great so Jason, you can glow. You won six twenty eight to to three ninety seven. Oh wow! I don't even think About we have five hundred twenty eight buildings in Corvallis. <laughs> right. Wow. So, this sort of internationalization, though, really got kicked off in a big way with those, you know, those Patronus twin towers I, in Kuala I've, Lumpur? Yes. In fact, I was there in 1996, and they were almost done. Yeah. And and here was what was the funny part, though. At that time, I learned that they were upset in Malaysia because somewhere else was about to surpass them. Like, they were going to be the and biggest. they hadn't even finished building it? And they hadn't quite finished, but they already <laughs> knew that someone was going to get bigger. Yeah. Yeah, just 1998 was when they opened, and they were the tallest at the time. So then Taipei 101 comes along in 2004 and just demolishes it. It, it <laughs> went up uh, to 1,667 feet. Ah, and uh, I was actually in Taipei just after it was finished. And I got to say, that was a surreal 
freaking building. First of all, it's set apart from the other skyscrapers. In case it of falls down. Is that- <laughs> I, you know what? I'm sure it had to do with, holy shit, we cannot afford the footprint in downtown uh-huh. Taipei right. to build uh-huh. this thing. We yeah. got to get kind of yeah. away. And then when you enter the place, the first thing you notice, it's a, a consumerism nightmare. It's uh-huh. like the, the bottom of the thing is all like posh shopping mall eatery stuff. There were like uh, fancy sports cars parked inside the you know the building, so you can. Drool it's all you over need. Those. They probably have everything you need, so you never have to leave the building. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I also remember like taking the elevator. It was one of those like ear popping right. Uh, right. thing. You know, just like so fast, and the view was I gotta say pretty damn. Impressive. You went up there too. Yeah, bigger, you, better than the Sears Tower. Yeah, I mean, you oh. feel like. I felt like I was on a par with the hills and, and mountains that, that surround the city. Mm-hmm. I mean, it... That's crazy. It, it is nuts. So when was... That was... You were there, like, what, 2000? Probably 2006 or seven. So a couple of years after so, it. So, I mean, things are even more crazy now, right? I mean, I think the tallest building now is the Burj Khalifa. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, in Dubai. And that's... You were saying the Taipei 101 was 1,667 feet, Yeah. right? So this building in Dubai is 2,717 Oh, that's crazy. Well, it's perfect, though. I mean, isn't Dubai... Uh, uh, it's like another, like, thousand feet higher. That's almost... That's over half a mile. And, well, speaking of which, there's okay. another one being built right now in Jeddah and Saudi Arabia, and that's going to be over a kilometer high. That's nice. 3,280 <laughs> feet or something. Oh, can you... That's I, just... It is nuts, but uh, you know, leave it to like Dubai, uh, at least for now. That, that seems to be our crazy town poster child. Yeah, city. Dubai. Is, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, desert. Uh, they're building new lands out islands, the, yeah, yeah, with different shapes and yeah. Oh, so let's get let's 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 step back now. We've we've reviewed the madness of our state of being. Now let's <laughs> let's step back and let's ask ourselves what drove all of this. Hmm, that's a good question. I. Well, can we just start with uh, just the kind of like the hubris of thinking we can. It's almost like this desire to accomplish this feat and keep testing ourselves and pushing ourselves and, yes. and you know, kind of surpassing the idea of limits. You know? I and, hear a biblical story coming well, on. <laughs> yeah, it makes me think. It does make me think of the Tower of Babel story, right? Like. Maybe that was the tallest building ever for a, for a while, but it didn't last very but long. It wasn't real, was it? Come on, of course it's real. <laughs> the Bible, everything in the Bible is real. Let me let me let me go back to my buddy Joel Osteen and yes. confirm that. So yeah, this is <laughs> obviously this is a story from from Genesis, and the I you know it's, it's it is a really great parable of 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 the hubris of humanity. What, what is it? I think about from the language thing where all suddenly everyone's speaking different tongues, but yeah. So this, these were people that, that descended from, from Noah after the flood, right? Okay. So there were a few people left and they all spoke the same language Yeah. and they decided that they were going to build a tower to reach heaven. And God was like, fuck you guys. Like you can't do that and knocked it down. And in the process, they lost their shared language. And that was the, the kind of the origin story of lots of languages. But it's kind of a stretch. But but again, you I think about these stories to. that are yeah. written way back, you know, this, this idea of like people wanting to push limits. And so there, um, they, so there's some guy back, back in the day, you know, we're got to go back 5000 years or so, who basically is kind of like us. And he wrote this thing down and said, like, "Look at these guys. Look at you. You think you're so smart. You think you're so big. God's gonna go win. Exactly. Wow. The, the saddest, I feel connected to my ancestors. The saddest part about it is, uh, you know, there were no elevators, so the system to climb to the top of the Tower oh. of Babel was Rapunzel with her braid <laughs> hanging out the window, and and she died in the uh, when the when the tower collapsed. Oh. Really well, sad. Well, she also lost a lot of her hair before yeah. that happened. Super very sad. very sad. Well." Okay, I mean, yeah, right. Uh, that maybe it's hubris, but I also think there's a. As we talked about, we were pretty proud as kids growing up in the in the eighties that America had the biggest skyscrapers. So there was a there's a status related to this. There's prestige. Sure. There's sort of a a projection of your power. <laughs> Let's be honest, projection of your manhood in some cases. There right? we go. Did you know that Trump's uh, speaking, <laughs> speaking of, which, of that Trump's hotels are often called. The Trump Hotel and Tower. I I think it's also sometimes called the Trump Hotel and Tower of Power. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a status thing and probably different developers, you know, wanting to to one up one another, right? You you have this with cities probably doing that. And I'm sure that that was like a oh, a yeah. big thing, right? It was like they well, get the tallest building, well, we're going to get the tallest and building. And now we do it with like sports stadiums is another way to go about that. Right. Well, or we're going to build penises that go into space instead oh, yeah, of that's... sticking up straight in the sky, right? Like <laughs> yes. that's how we're going to Yo, a kilometer, give me a break, buddy. I'm going to Mars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I, the Galactic's virgin, so they're not really thinking about sex. I I like that idea of rocket ships as like a, some kind of natural air to skyscrapers. Yeah. Like, how come Trump <laughs> didn't do rockets? You know? <laughs> it was late to the game. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, there's there's actually another driver of all this that I found really fascinating, and it has to do with positive feedback loops, which... I will invite our listeners to check out the episode we did on that last season. There was this positive feedback loop that occurred uh, with building a, a tall building in the midst of a city. And it, it would kind of go like this. You you build your building and you get a lot of businesses moving in. And they're they're kind of making a hub for the economy. And so you get all this economic growth going. And then the uh, rents start going up, the value of the land starts going up, and it, it incentivizes the next building to be built, and you've got more economic growth. So you kind of get into mm. this positive feedback loop, this spiral that makes you put building after building, and, and that's how you ended up like in the 1920s in New York with this like spasm happening. Yeah, and it's, it's probably part of a larger economic dynamic where – you have these centers, right, that become like like New York's a center of finance or whatever. They become huge economic powerhouses, and that drives more and more people to want to be there and all the support services that exist. So that requires not just incredibly tall buildings for all those businesses, but for housing, right? Because you want to cram mm-hmm. people into this tight space. So you saw that in New York in the 20s and, you know, have that in places in China today. You know, is it Shenzhen that's like... They have something like 87 skyscrapers under construction right now. I don't know if you've been to cities recently where you just look at like the skyline and all you see are these enormous cranes in the sky because they're doing this. I can't imagine the number of cranes that they have to have to build 87 skyscrapers at once. I know we're going to get into this uh, a bit later, but just imagining like what people in that space think the future is going to be. Like there's just cranes and skyscrapers and just like. But I, I just, it, let's let's remember, of course, that none of this could happen without what we've called, you know, high energy modernity, mm-hmm. where you just take for granted the skyscraper builders and the architects are taking for granted all the electricity they could want, all the water treatment they could want, right? All of the transportation systems they could want, all of the waste removal systems they could want. Yeah. All of this is sort of in the background as as an assumption that I think has allowed then for people to feel the freedom to just build more and more and bigger. Yeah, the, the technology follows that, right? The, you're, you're not going to be coming up with the, these innovations in structural designs if you know, you don't have the basics, that, that foundation of all that energy, all that electricity, all that heavy materials moving equipment available to do the thing that your technology says you can do. Yeah. And cheap fossil fuels basically back yeah. that all up. Yeah. It's interesting to think about because you have like the, the foundation of sort of the energetic basis and the material basis, like all all the materials have to go into it and the energy has to go into it and that has to exist in order for this to be a possibility. And then on, on the other end of the equation, there's like the hubris, the desire, the whatever it is that are the motivations, the profit motivations of developers driving them to create technological improvements or whatever to to keep testing these limits and go bigger and bigger, right? Mm-hmm. Can we just, can we get to what really matters here for, yeah. for, our, for our purposes, <laughs> which is like the downsides, you know, like, What's what's wrong with this picture? Are you talking about like the basements of the skyscrapers? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what I'm talking about. I, okay. That's what's wrong with the picture. I, I got a little downside story to share with you guys, okay? okay? okay. I'm, I'm going to introduce you to another guy here, a guy named Gary Hoy, okay? Uh, was he Gar- like an architect or something? No, or? no. Gary was a 38-year-old lawyer, 
And he worked in the uh, Toronto Dominion Bank Tower. Oh, Canadian. Yeah. And for some reason, Gary was fond of bragging about the strength of his building's windows to any visitors that, that came along. Is this because like these, these these buildings can be kind of intimidating? You you walk up and it's often yeah. floor to ceiling glass. Yeah, like you had these huge glass windows and right. people would come in and he'd say, Don't worry, right. it's strong. Watch <laughs> this. And he would he would throw his body into the window and bounce off onto the floor and see, look how strong it is. Yeah, yeah, it's it's rated. Well, so one day in uh, 1993, old Gary had oh, no. uh, some some visiting law students in his office on the 24th floor, and uh, he he <laughs> he's showing he showed show him off. he ran at the window and he bounced off and he said, "See, look how strong it is, everybody!" And just for good measure, he did it again. Well, someone double dog dared him. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> second time. Well, let's just say if if uh, you were a fan of like Jim uh, Morrison or the Doors, you. You might say he managed to break on through to the other side. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he, he went right through the window. So have you I, – I learned the term defenestration. You guys know this word? Oh, you're going to tell me. Does that mean he lost his head? <laughs> defenestration is the act of – Throwing or being thrown through a window. <laughs> That's what? a great so, term. Yeah, I don't know. Does this uh, happen that often that they need to come up with a term for it? I don't know, but it's a great term. It is a I great mean, term. You're going to try to work this in on buddy, a daily but basis. But if you're not careful, I'm going to defenestrate you. Exactly. So <laughs> so uh, old uh, Gary Hoy there, he he died of accidental self-defenestration. <laughs> Do you think that um, that the that his coroner. family's lawsuit against the, the window company... That, that that worked? I doubt it. Uh, I, in <laughs> fact, so I read the... Well, they're Canadian. They probably didn't sue. If it was the United States, right. yeah, it would yeah. definitely have been a loss. Well, I read the Darwin Award that he... Oh, did he, he win he, it possibly? Yes, of course. Oh, nice. Of course. And they're all posthumous. Did they get some money? <laughs> I know. I know they're all posthumous. <laughs> okay. I, I won the Darwin Award. I wish award. you could be here to receive this award. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't be here tonight. Uh, Gary, uh, sorry he, about it, buddy. He, he drops in for his entrance. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Literally drops in. Yeah. So, so I read that and uh, they were... Some engineer was quote. He's like, "There is no way any window would ever be certified to have a hundred and sixty pound man huck himself at it <laughs> multiple times." Right. Uh, wow. Do your research, people. So oh there, there's your there's a downside to having a tall building. You could have accidental self defenestration right. as a common. So downside, common stupid death. people. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's one downside. Another that's related to here, obviously, is sort of poor. You know, the risk of poor construction. What happens with with poor construction? That's true for all buildings, but when you have these large large buildings that are poorly constructed with probably a lot more strain on them. Yeah. That. It's truly cataclysmic when there's something bad that happens. And and you guys recall the story of that condominium that collapsed in Miami not too long ago. Um, yeah. Last year, you know, uh, almost 100 people died in that. And that was a 12-story tall building, right. not even the hugest building in the world. But And you have, unfortunately, cases of this from around the world where buildings are built with maybe not the highest standards or, yeah. you know, they don't have the infrastructure put in to have people testing. And in human environments, the, the, the rebar starts rusting that's in the concrete. And so a lot of these concrete rebar buildings, right. they, that's what they talked about in the Miami case. Yeah. But um, I have a question for Rob. This might be a little before your time, but okay. do you remember the, 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 the classic movie Towering Inferno? I mean, I know the title, but I've never seen it. Yeah, so you don't know what year that was. It's before your time. Do you know what year that was? No. 1974. Wow. So I find that kind of fascinating because this sort of this sort of this movie was about this giant it was like a it was like a brand new giant office building downtown and it goes on fire. Of course it's just a, it's just it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Well, that was probably like a heyday of disaster movies, right? Yeah. Cuz the, the only disaster movie I know is the spoof uh, airplane, but I'm sure that's based off of you know, some kind of air disaster movie. Yeah. But there was recently, I guess a few years ago in London in 2017, the Grenfell Tower fire yeah. uh, was a big deal. And there, there was this crazy scenes of people being rescued. So it, it, it can happen. So. Yeah. There are also terrorist attacks. Yes. Right? I mean, yes. uh, there's obviously a very famous case. Of, but there's a, le- a little slightly lesser known one that was documented in this uh, in a documentary 
Okay. The Nakatomi Towers, <laughs> the the Plaza Building in in Los Angeles. Do you know this documentary? That yeah, that was a uh, that was a really uh, cutting edge know. documentary at the time. I remember uh, uh, the German terrorist Hans Gruber right. uh, kind of kidnapped the whole building. It it was called Die Hard. The documentary. <laughs> um, no wonder Rob knows all about it. See, you, I, I, I went back to seventy four. He was clueless. Yeah. Throw something in the eighties. Yeah, bang. My man's on. Yeah, that's okay. uh, I, that's a nice a save full to share. Three quarters of my brain is yeah. reserved for that, but yeah. obviously, in in terrorist attacks, you're talking about the the World Trade Center and the Twin Towers were actually the tallest buildings for a couple of years just before the Sears Tower was finished, but. You know, we had about 3,000 deaths uh, that, that happened. And I mean, I, I remember that day so clearly. Um, and I, I'm sure you yeah. know, a lot of people obviously have a terrible experience there. But it's a, it's a real risk. I mean, any some kind of disaster, whether it's accidental or intentional, you're vulnerable in a building of that size. Right. It, I think the point here is not that, hey, if you have a skyscraper, it's going to be attacked. It's It's more talking about... This concentration yeah. of people and the vulnerability of that if there is an acute crisis that happens. Yeah. Right? right. It's interesting to think about like the pandemic hmm. too. Just, you know, I'm thinking about it on a couple of levels. One is in these dense urban communities where people are living in high rise buildings, right. there are uh, oftentimes the costs are, are prohibitive for, for many people. They live in these tiny, tiny, tiny apartments and i can't I, th- I thought about this a lot like the pandemic especially the periods of time where we were kind of in lockdown you mm-hmm. know at home the sort of privilege and fortune that like I, my family had to have our own home right you know, with enough space for us to be all stuck home together go outdoors you know, if you want <laughs> thinking about families in in places where they're living in in these tiny you know uh. few hundred square foot you know 500 square foot 800 square foot homes, you know, with little kids or whatever, and they're stuck there. In some places, like, they literally aren't, you're not allowed to leave. Yeah. Right. But then there are also things that, that I think we've been learning about, like ventilation and some of the health risks of being in these. You can't even open these, the windows in most right. of these yeah, anymore. Yeah, the, the, the envelope is so You know, when, when we would go out hiking on a trail during some of the lockdown times, we're very explicit about expressing gratitude for having the option to do that and, and thinking about people living in a yeah. in a high rise building in New York City or downtown Chicago or somewhere and how much harder it would be on on people in that situation. Yeah. I also kind of think about you know, we talk about the Miami place that that uh that that uh, condo or apartment complex that collapsed. Mm-hmm. Well, think about how many of the cities we mentioned that have these giant structures are at risk for sea level rise. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's a complete overlap between these highly densely populated cities and coastal areas, right? I, I don't I don't really see that as a downside. That means you're going to have a pool in the lobby floor <laughs> oh. of your building, right? Oh yeah, That's I mean the pool right. the pool is going to be just everywhere. You could take your grade B. Yeah, building. it's just like Venice, right? You yeah. just ride. You have a boat. You there know, you take to work and okay, yeah, and you you take your grade B building and turn it into an A plus. I mean, <laughs> I'm ordering a coconut beverage uh, down by the poolside yeah. when I get down to the the bottom floor. It's yeah, great. the coconuts will probably be growing in New York City <laughs> by then. So, <laughs> well, uh, I guess we seem to be going back and forth between haha joke and haha serious or uh uh-uh, serious and. Uh, I guess on a serious front, you think about the vulnerability. Uh, you're on the 127th floor in your condo, and the power goes out for an extended period of time. You know, like what? Yeah. What then? You yeah. know, and and if it's actually out for a really long time, what happens? And I I read the book The Upside of Down by Thomas Homer Dixon, mm-hmm. who's a really amazing systems thinker and gets all this stuff about energy, and he was talking about that like. You know, there's probably going to be a time where people are walking out of the city because you can't really live. You know, if you have a disruption of of that sort of of electricity, how are you living on that hundred and whatever floor? Yeah, I mean, there's the temporary 
blackouts, and we've had situations like that where people were were in a distress situation. But yeah, what you're talking about is like, what if that was more of the permanent condition? Yeah. So know? what are some of the more? I, guess, I think this is more important is to think of what are the bigger long term risks. Well, I, I think. I think there's risks, but there's also, I think, something that's really important to recognize. And, you know, when we're talking about some of these energy and environmental risks, we're talking about climate and energy just now, there's this, uh, we've talked about this before a little bit, but there's this dominant assumption that exists that cities are greener, (laughs) they're they're more efficient. And so let's put a bunch of people in these tall buildings, and that's a more efficient way of living where we're using less energy and if I have to read another article that says New York City is the greenest city in America, I think I uh, I might have a conniption. I might need some carminative balsam to yeah. deal with the <laughs> Well, the, and, the and this gets to where, you know, understanding energy and understanding and, and thinking about where we draw the boundaries, right? So if you're talking about the operational use, you know, of energy versus the embodied use of energy, that's where people get stuck, I think, a lot of times. And there was actually um, there was a study that was published by uh, Ruth Saint and Francesco Pomponi in Journal Nature, where they they try to look at the whole life cycle of of carbon emissions of different building types. It was really fascinating to look at that because, as I was just saying, they looked at the operational side of it. You know, what are the carbon emissions that are generated while the building is in use? And mm-hmm. obviously, that depends on the sources of electricity and other things that are, that are happening there. How much time each resident is spending in the metaverse? <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. And then there's the embodied carbon, which is like all of the emissions that go into the extraction, the production, transport, manufacturing of all the raw materials and the process of building the building and all that stuff, right? And that's the thing is a lot of this embodied energy use is often not calculated. And it's not used, for example, for a lot of these green building certifications or energy efficiency laws. So the idea being that you could build something that is incredibly elaborate, gigantic, thick walls, all this material goes into it and you get this you get then incredible energy certificate levels of yeah. of efficiency but how much went into that and so i think that's that's something that needs to be taken into account is all the energy and emissions produced during maintenance refurbishment demolition in addition to then the building of this there's yeah. a life cycle the life cycle approach right now has what's called to a too narrow boundary of analysis yeah, that's amazing to think about the demolition. Like if you had a 10-story building, you had to demolish it. You know, that's that's painful and there's a lot of stuff to deal with and move. But you got to demolish, you know, a hundred and whatever story A kilometer building. tall building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, yeah. got, you got a serious problem you got to stand pretty far back too. Yeah, yeah it's uh, – I've, I've actually been in buildings that really – and I'm not trying to poo-poo them. But like, you know, they, they worked on LEED certification, right. you know, and they – they did all this work to try to green their operations as much as possible. And they have these like dashboards, you know, that you could see like in the lobby, right? Showing mm-hmm. how much water is being consumed and how much electricity and how efficient they are, you know, and they might have solar panels on the roof or whatever. And, and a lot of that is like really cool to see, but nowhere in there is like the, the embodied energy. They, right. they don't, we they destroyed don't talk, a continent building. This right. They building. don't talk about the sunk <laughs> yeah. you know, carbon and how long it's going to take to quote unquote pay that off or right. whatever, however you try to think of it. Yeah. Concrete um, is one of the, uh, cement is one of the most yeah. carbon intensive things. So, so St. and Pomponi concluded in this, in this report that they did that, that it's actually densely built low rise environments that are more space and carbon efficient. High rise buildings have a much higher carbon impact. Hmm. So they're not saying, you know, don't live in cities, which I, I think we could have a more maybe nuanced conversation about, but mm-hmm. like they're saying, okay, high density, but it should be low rise. You yeah. know, and they point to cities like Paris that are more environmentally friendly than than a city like New York. And I think that that's often contrary to what people think. Right. And, and I just want to mention as another kind of thing that you just touched on really briefly, this this idea of demolition. And that is, we talk about the life cycle yeah. of the emissions, but what is the lifespan of these buildings as well? Yeah. You know, a really important thing, I think, to think about. And if the lifespan is limited, are you locked in? What are your options? Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And what's a retrofit 
on the Empire State Building versus a 10-story building. Yeah, you know? yeah. the Empire State Building is going through some kind of retrofits right now to try to make it greener, by the way. Yeah. Well, and this kind of leads me back to what I was talking about with Thomas Homer Dixon, like the blackout thing. I mean, it, you don't have to just key in on electricity going down. You You can sort of look at what happens when we can't support the level of complexity that's needed to maintain one of these buildings? Uh, you know, an example would be these high-speed elevators, yeah. right? They need special parts. Right. Well, maybe that part's no longer <laughs> available. So yeah. now what? You're, you're, uh, you know, you got to get a really good pogo stick to get to your apartment. <laughs> and, yeah. and they may also be dealing with this already with supply chain issues. Yeah, who that knows, we're right? It's yeah. not like you're going to hear that in the news right now unless there's a catastrophe. Yeah, but like something breaks down. And, hey, you, know, you you're... said that that tower in Jeddah has not been completed. We got a yeah. conspiracy the... theory we can... Uh, we can start start in on now. Well, this gets to this concept of what's called urban metabolism. And it's the idea that cities are uh, akin to organisms in mm-hmm. a sense, where you've got, just to think about an organism, we ingest food, we have waste, yeah. um, we ingest water, we have waste, we have circulatory systems, we have nervous systems. All those things are analogous in cities, mm-hmm. but it's instead it's it's electric wires, it's piping, right? It's, Roads and transportation. Yeah, tra- yeah, trains and and trucks and automobiles and airplanes and boats. And so basically, when you when you look at it from this this you know the do step back and say what's the herb what's an urban metabolism look like? I think there's a fundamental structural problem that makes these highly complex highly industrialized urban landscapes essentially impossible to maintain during what you this you talked about the great simple simplification and an analogy i think about is sort of um in in biology is called endotherms versus ectotherms so an endotherm is like us we're warm we're warm uh, blooded right we have this constant body temperature so structurally we have this baseline demand which is about for humans it's about 100 watts where we're burning 100 watts at a minimum all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, you take you find a giant lizard that's about my size, for like a kimono dragon or whatever. Right. And that thing is at a tenth. It has like it has like a 10 watt baseline metabolism. They can just chill out. If you're in a city, you can never chill out. There's always somebody flicking on lights, putting on an HVAC, right? Yeah. Uh flushing a toilet. There's no chilling out. You've structurally demanded high input so, systems. So let me just summarize your uh, your analogy or your theory here. Yeah. So a city is a shitty human who is wasteful <laughs> and obnoxious and <laughs> Somewhere out in the countryside is a wonderful, awesome Komodo dragon yeah. <laughs> that lives a virtuous life. Oh, I could say that. <laughs> but, well, the other way to think about we, it is like... We've got to call up the journal Nature and get this one published. <laughs> well, if you think about it, a term that uh, that Bill Reese said, it was uh, he's, he called cities feed, basically structurally analogous to feedlots, but for people, right? Wow. You have to truck all the food and water in you have to truck all the waste out. Yeah. Whereas if you have a cow or a cattle on a pasture, they're basically getting what they need from their environment and their and their waste is being processed from the environment. Yeah, and in our case, our product is us being on, on social media and they could sell our information about us and that's how they profit versus us <laughs> you know, creating milk or, or meat or right. something, right? So, yeah. you know, when I see things like these vertical farm ideas that you see once in a while, like we have to grow food in cities. Yeah. To me, that's a symptom of that of this recognition by people that living in urban environments that we're missing some key basic needs here. But the response is sort of telling because it's coming from this urban culture, this high high energy modernity kind of culture. And they can't imagine not just living in a city and making it work somehow. Well, I guess that's uh, time then to change the title of this from Crazy Town to Welcome to the Human Feedlot. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people would want to listen to that. <laughs> Let's try it. Hey. 
Hey, you guys, remember last season we had author and media theorist Douglas Rushkoff on the program? Yeah, he has the podcast Team Human. I love it. And it was incredible. It was three hosts to one guest. And yeah. he, he handled himself He's beautifully. Still outshined us by of uh, incredible right. wattage. Is supposed to. He guess is supposed to. Yeah, I, t- I think the podcast is great too, and I would recommend it to our listeners. I mean, the truth is, you know, if I had to vote, humans are probably not the top of my list. He makes you want. Species. He makes you root for our yeah, team a little it's, bit. It's so true, Douglas. He, he makes me job. want to be on team. Human. He does a good job. You you can be on team non-human a share. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. (laughs) My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. (laughs) Okay, in the do the opposite section here, I want to start us off with with a little quote. You already took us back to the Bible a share a little earlier, and I'm going to take us now to the uh, Tao Te Ching. So another... I don't know, you can call it a biblical text, but uh, I guess a religious text. And so uh, this comes from the Stephen Mitchell translation, uh, 1991. And there's a passage in there that says, In dwelling, live close to the ground. In thinking, keep to the simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. In governing, don't try to control. In work, do what you enjoy. In family life, be completely present. Oh, that's all pretty good. Yeah. I, well, I remember reading that, and I, I thought when I was young, all of those things seemed right to me, except the first one, in dwelling, live close to the ground. Because at the time, I was living in a high rise, and uh, and I liked the view. Right. And it's taken me a lot more time and introspection to really get it. It's And it... It is uh, something that's changed for me, living close to the ground. And it's, it's like being much closer to nature. And I think it's way more in alignment with how we evolved and what our psychology is supposed to be. So the the action here, for me anyway, was that you've got to change your mindset about kind of what, what you find inspiring. You know, it's kind of easy to say, oh, that giant glass and steel building is inspiring and the view is cool. But I think there's a lot more nuance to be had in finding the ecology of where you live. Yeah, you inspiring. can't see the blades of grass from up there. Right. And if we want to if we want to be inspired by tall things, let's, let's keep tall trees and yeah. mountains and yeah, along those lines, you know, we had talked earlier about the the studies that were done that showed that that low rise environments, densely populated, densely built low rise environments, were were more efficient. And so, I think uh, another maybe do the opposite. Maybe might be thinking about where we're choosing to live, what kind of community we're putting ourselves in. Um, obviously, there's a lot of questions for people now around economic opportunity and. And there's something really wonderful about living in a in a cosmopolitan city with all the cultural benefits and diversity and all that stuff. But you know, if, if you really do take seriously the the issues that that we raise on this podcast and others are raising, it makes a big difference where you're living in terms of of um, you know your vulnerability and risk. So uh, choose wisely. Yeah, I mean, I always say, uh, God, the future is rural. That's the title of you know some of the publications I've had, and and so uh, move out of of big cities for gosh sakes is what I often try to say, and people yeah. think I'm kind of nutty for that, but yeah. Well, and if you are going to live in uh, a, a densely populated place, you know, maybe you do need some bigger buildings. There's some interesting architectural advancement happening right now where. Buildings can be made of materials that use less embodied energy. So there's an 18-story building near Oslo, Norway that just opened up in 2019 that's made of engineered wood products that have a really strong strength-to-weight ratio, and they're less flammable than, say, like an old-school wooden structure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some further tech advancement that's about, hey, how do we have less embodied energy? Not about, hey, how tall can we build this, uh, this behemoth? Right. And here's the last suggestion. Let's, let's try to get people to adopt new building codes in cities. And that code should be that if 
Well, how old are you when you were in college and you did that run up the uh, up the stairway? <laughs> like nineteen years okay. old. Yeah. So you take a fit twenty year old, and you say the limit is how far they can run upstairs without completely <laughs> being out of breath and like you know near vomiting. Right? That's as tall as you can go. I don't know with uh, with CrossFit now on, you're gonna have people oh, right. running like thirty two miles <laughs> into the sky. <laughs> okay, then how far can a ninety seven year old woman walk up the stairs? Yeah. We should make that. Well, it's certainly not gonna be a ninety seven year old man because they they don't exist. We 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 all died. Uh, so uh, one one last thing from me too. You just said, Jason, the future is rural. I. Love your report too, but also the future is on Earth. Can yeah. we just stop with the uh, the space penis launching billionaires burning fossil fuels? At least until they figure out how to launch a rocket without burning anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll, uh, I'll get on on that after this show. Right. I'll, I'll email those guys well, and just say, "Can you just cut this out?" And so we'll, I know we'll see what I know that there's no way for our average uh, person on the street to to affect this, except. By being willing to enter into conversations. Because, you know, there's going to be people that are, they think this is inspiring. Right. It's all over the news. Like, ha ha, Elon Musk launches another rocket. And this is where you can say, well, I'm not sure that's a great idea. And here's why. Yeah. Or you could just ridicule the hell out of them like we do. It's right. Yeah. <laughs> Always the most effective way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We just gave you a whole bunch of do the opposite ideas so you can take action in your life and community. If that's too much at this time in your life, do something real simple. Give us a five-star rating on Spotify or any other podcast app and hit the share button to let your friends know about Crazy Town. Hey guys, so um, yeah, when I was marketing this show, I got some amazing feedback by this company because uh, we really live in a time of safety culture. Yeah, we have seatbelts and um, all kinds of stuff. Safety and, pins. Yeah, you can't open your safety dance. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can't even open your like medical jars anymore, right? <laughs> but anyhow, this is an amazing response to a lot of the issues we've brought up in the show about uh, about the dangers of these high rises, these skyscrapers. This company is called Towerfall, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's a serious business because yeah. what they do is they, they basically attach this add-on to the side of your building. And if there's a disaster, this giant airbag inflates out across the sidewalk and just make this big little kind of puffy thing that you just go up to your, the, the roof and you just hurl yourself off. So you're, you're 89 89- stories up and you're just gonna it doesn't matter off. as far as you want to be you could you could be a mile high they don't care this thing this this will handle the, your handle you really yeah yeah so how, how how bad do you think the bounce is well okay the thing is every year you know the the, the building super is yeah. supposed to like say we're having a test oh really <laughs> yeah you want to make sure it really works so it goes out and so you know you're gonna start seeing a lot of these as they get installed. You'll see a lot of uh, that's uh, when you start seeing vacancies in the building, right? After that. <laughs> so you know I I can go along with uh, this idea. Like it would have saved Gary Hoy. You yes. Know? He would have. They would have deployed, and he would have just had a good story. But could you talk to this company about their name, Towerfall? Uh, that might not be. Uh... It's it's trademarked. So so shut up and and and, and lobby. <laughs> Lobby for Tower Fall wherever you wherever high raise building you live in. Crazy town. Da, 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 crazy town.